Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another busy week on the electricity front, with some more clarity emerging on the emergency power bits, NERSA looking at the future of the system and its role, and big movement on the wind energy front. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. There is greater clarity on the nature and pricing of the bids selected in the emergency power bid. That's correct. You know, sort of, uh, Energy Minister Gwede Mantash announced the eight preferred bidders and also a reserve bidder, um, which we don't know the identity of yet because there's still a value for money discussion underway. But he gave us a range in terms of the pricing, in terms of uh, rand per megawatt hour uh, on the evaluation of those tenders. And subsequently, more clarity has emerged as to what the different bids are in terms of money. And we see there's really four categories of projects. There's the pure gas projects, the car power ships that are going to be docked in Kucha, Saldana Bay and Richards Bay. Uh, and they're going to be using uh, um, imported gas, uh, liquefied natural gas. Then there's a, a project that combines solar and gas. Um, uh, so that would be the second category. Then there's a couple of projects that combine um, solar and battery energy storage and one that combines solar, wind and battery energy storage. And interestingly, the, the lowest cost bid was the solar battery storage bid. That, that came in at uh, 1,462 Rand per megawatt hour. So that was the, the Aqua Power project. And uh, the, the, the next most competitive were the two car power ship uh, projects. The first, uh, the lowest cost one being in, in Kucha and then the second one in Richards Bay. Then there was a combination of the solar um, and battery storage and solar and gas projects. And sort of the highest bid was this combination of uh, uh, solar, uh, PV and gas, which will be 1,885 Rand per megawatt hour. These are evaluation prices, so there's still some water to go under the bridge and we don't know the, f the final cost because, you know, obviously uh, we know what the the cost of the th once these projects are built for wind and solar, the fuel is free, but you will always be uh, subject to some sort of vagaries on the gas price. So I think that would be uh, something to look out for in the future. The big thing now is whether these projects will be able to reach financial close in the, de the very short deadline uh, provided by July and then get connected to the grid in 2022 uh, by August. So th what also has become clear when people evaluated this project, this, the architecture was very much geared towards a sort of conventional uh, power supply, a gas to power really projects because the, it really need the electricity needed to be uh, dispatchable between five in the morning at 9.30 at night. You know, we know that uh, soda doesn't, uh, there's no sun at night, so therefore you have to design your project um, to, to match that that profile. So what we've seen is very uh, oversized solar and wind projects where there is the wind component and then very oversized batteries. These are going to be some of the biggest batteries installed anywhere in the world to match this um, dispatchability profile architecture of the scheme. And what's also clear is if the scheme had been slightly tweaked to for instance allow uh, the battery systems to charge from the grid uh, during those low peak, low, low demand periods, generally at night, the prices for those uh, battery energy storage type linked projects, so the renewable storage projects, would have been quite a lot uh, cheaper and much more competitive. So it was the rules were the rules. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of the rules because they were so geared towards a sort of conventional type system, a gas to power type system, but they were the rules, and it is quite interesting to see how uh, renewables projects responded. Uh, these are projects that people would have been really focused, these are sites that would have been focused towards just a pure solar or wind project. And they had to reconfigure these sites to allow for battery energy storage. So, and it was also with the backdrop of uh, the knowledge that there's going to be more renewable energy rounds coming from the IPP office. So a lot of projects would have rather kept their powder dry for the, the REAP program, which has now kicked off. Uh, so the, the lack, there was probably a lack of competition as well that would have also helped drive down the price. But definitely the architecture was of the, the, the risk mitigation program was tricky, uh, and yet some companies were able to navigate it. It will now be about getting to financial close, getting shovel on the ground, and eventually producing that electricity. And it will be 
hopefully these projects will all cross the line, although I think there is some uh, potential for legal challenge, it seems, uh, around the car powerships and the dominant role that they're playing in the system. But there's nothing formal yet on that front. NERSA has been looking towards the future this week. Yes, so uh, NERSA is trying to update its own strategic plan and it's doing this uh, in the form of uh, uh, stakeholder engagement as well. So they're doing their internal work and then getting stakeholders to pr provide input. There was immediate unhappiness uh, in the public about the short uh, lead time around, uh, around these hearings that took place. Um, but uh, NERSA has went ahead uh, despite some of those objections. And I think what NERSA is trying to get is some sort of, you know, one of the questions, what is the end state uh, going to look like of the electricity supply industry and how should NERSA, you know, position itself in within that end state? And I think the, the, the key message that uh, was coming across from what I could see is that, the end, you know, the end state or the future is not going to look or not going to resemble the past. And therefore, the energy regulator is going to have to find a way to be relevant as we transition from a system that is vertically integrated, dominated by one company, uh, right through the system, also by municipalities at the distribution end, to a system that's going to be far more distributed, have far more moving parts, have far more players or participants in that, and different technologies. So the way it looks at uh, uh, the system is going to be quite different from the past, and it needs to make sure it's a facilitator of that rather than an impediment. Now, we know that there's been a lot of criticism of the role that uh, the regulator has played, but playing within the rules provided by the policymaker, that's government, um, in terms of unlocking, for instance, distributed generation by large consumers. So I think the message was, you know, re regulator, you need to be aware of these changes, that, as I say, the future is not going to resemble the past, and you need to get yourself uh, fit for the future and you need to not be seen as an impediment to the transition, but rather a key facilitator in the transition. I think that's the message that came across. Whether NERSA sees it like that uh, will be a, a, could be quite an, a different story entirely. And global wind installations reached a record level last year. Yes, over 90 gigawatts of wind was installed uh, across the world last year, most of it in China um, and the US. Um, Onshore it was divided very much between the US and China. They were the main uh, deploy, uh, installers of new wind, but China was the dominant in terms of offshore. Uh, so that's quite a change because Europe's really the center of offshore development and there's still going to be a lot of, you know, with all these stimulus schemes and all the money that's flowing um, into Europe's green economy, we're going to see a lot more offshore development. But last year, there was a lot of, uh, well, the, the dominant, most of the six gigawatts that was installed was out of China or over half. So that's, uh, and in South Africa also had a good year in terms of wind installations. We know that it took us very long to sign the, the, um, the projects that were procured back in 2014, but eventually those projects did reach financial close. And those uh, round four uh, wind projects are now, st now starting to enter commercial operation. And that's when the Global Wind Energy uh, Council measures it. So we had f over 500 megawatts that entered from wind last year. But I think the big message from the, the Wind Energy Council, and this is the message that's coming out from a number of organizations that are now analyzing ahead of COP26. We know there's going to be these big, this big climate gathering in November in Glasgow, Scotland, and there are going to be new uh, pledges made, including South Africa's. Uh, South Africa's cabinet has approved the release of our new pledge on a nationally determined contribution in terms of how we're going to lower emissions and adapt to climate change. So there's ahead of that, there's a lot of work going into how do we meet the, the target of not breaching that one and a half degree centigrade uh, temperature rise from pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. And uh, so the International Energy Agency and the Renew International Renewable Energy Agency have done some modeling, some very recent modeling by IRENA, some older modeling by um, the International Energy Agency, which is going to be updated soon uh, with a whole lot of new reports. But these are now looking at a firm date of net zero by 2050. And if we try 
achieve that, and we've already seen a number of country pledges and a growing number of country pledges in terms of net zero. Even Eskom, South Africa's coal-heavy utility, is saying that it is uh, wanting to pledge towards net zero. South Africa itself hasn't made a, a net zero pledge, but th the main contributor to our emissions is saying that it wants to be have an, a net zero ambition by 2050. And then there's corporations, massive amounts of corporations that are making pledges by 2050. What does the ener energy or the electricity and the energy system have to look like by 2050 uh, to, to reach that? And it, it's clearly that clear that renewable energy, specifically solar and wind, are going to be the dominant providers of electricity. The biggest energy carrier in the system is going to be electricity, which is either going to be used directly in the form of uh, you know, uh, lighting, as we do now, all, all the normal things, uh, but also heating, as well as mobility, so we'll see a lot more electric cars, for instance. And where it can't be used directly and there needs to be uh, intermediation, some of that electricity, uh, renewable electricity, is going to be used to split water into uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and that hydrogen, in turn, is either going to be used directly or indirectly in the form of ammonia or green ethanol or um, carbon neutral jet fuel. Um, so, so it's uh, it's it's clear that to get that amount of renewable energy, we need to start installing solar and wind at a whole different uh, level and scale. And the, uh, the Global Wind Energy Council, GWEC, did an analysis of that and they said, you know, we're doing around this 90 gigawatts a year and that's going to be our average till 2025, which is record levels. But if we want to meet uh, the sort of targets that are set by the International Energy Agency and uh, ARENA for net zero by 2050, at least it has to, by the end of the decade, we need to be installing more, more like 180 gigawatts a year, that's a doubling up. And by the middle of the f that following dec decade, we need to be doing sort of closer to the 260 gigawatts a year. So it's a, it's a massive scale up and uh, it is a daunting task. And if you look at that, that's a fairly mature industry. If you look at green hydrogen, which is a totally nascent industry, the scale up is, is really going to be quite dramatic. So these are going to be key economic uh, drivers. And what was interesting from GREC is that we need, th as the oil and gas companies, you can see their contribution, oil and gas contribution is going to shrink massively um, by 2050. Coal will be a slither. Um, but, uh, you know, so they are already on clean energy transitions, especially the European oil and gas majors. And what's quite interesting here is the link that um, the wind companies, especially the offshore wind companies, are wanting to have a closer relationship with the oil and gas providers because they've got that offshore experience. They know how to manage mega projects. They know how to scale. They know how to uh, secure finance. And there seems to be, you know, if we're going to really scale up to the sort of levels, these 180 gigawatts a year of wind onshore and offshore, we're really going to have to cooperate across, cooperate across the, the energy uh, value chain and those traditional oil and gas companies are going to probably be key in helping to scale up, especially offshore wind. So it's a big year, but not big enough in terms of what we need if we're going to start meeting these very ambitious targets, which are going to be firmly co firm commitments from November this year. I think once uh, Glasgow is over, there's going to be firm pledges where countries are go the, got these net zero carbon emission commitments and therefore this decade and the decade between 2030 and those two decades to 2050 are going to be massive, uh, massively important because every year that we fall behind the, the installation curve just steepens and if we don't meet, obviously if we don't meet those targets then the risk in terms of climate change is that much greater. So a uh, very interesting analysis coming out of the global wind energy sector this week. Thank you. That's the second Take Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News daily email newsletter.